Welcome, Chamath. Thanks. You're fresh off uh, an airplane uh, from Toronto. From Toronto. And yet you still look uh, more stylish I than I do. It's I feel like I've traveled to Mecca. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think most people here are familiar with your, your, your work evangelizing for Bitcoin. You wrote a great essay for Bloomberg View last summer, why, yeah. why I invest in Bitcoin. Uh, but bring us up to speed on where you are now as an investor in Bitcoin, uh, personally and, and via your affiliated uh, funds. Uh, I think across all of the vehicles that I control, we're approaching um, just a little under 100,000 coins. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think we'll keep buying more. Um, you know, personally, I sort of have this belief that everybody in the world should probably have at least 1% of their assets in Bitcoin, um, not any other altcoin, specifically Bitcoin. And uh, I think that, the, that we're just at the beginning. And, you know, what happened yesterday, by the way, at the IRS, hugely important. I was going to ask you about that. They, they, they ruled that they would classify it as property. And by the way, for anyone that, who thinks like all of a sudden this is a bad thing, it's actually a really good thing. <clears throat> there has been tax policy that has been exploited by rich people for years that have allowed us to wash taxes on anything that we own. And now, because we can own Bitcoin, I think that people will figure out via smart contracts and via triple entry accounting a simple way to transfer and waterfall down those capabilities to the average everyday individual. So, you know, you've heard of, uh, or you may want to Google this person's name, but there's a really, really well-known billionaire by the name of John Malone. He's famous not only for consolidating the cable industry, everything else, Brad, you know him well, but he's also paid virtually no tax. And part of the structures that he set up is by treating things as property, being able to do property swaps, asset swaps, right? and being able to defer tax all the way down the line. So all of a sudden now, if Bitcoin is a property, all we need in the combination of a smart contract and some clever accounting, which we all know how to implement in software, you can now take that same mechanism and cascade it down to the individual person even using a Satoshi for a transaction. So I think what happened yesterday is really important. It just, it now creates a big window. There was a worry though that it would create extra friction around having to calculate capital gains on every transaction. But this is, this is what I'm saying. I think that's because people who haven't had access to extremely sophisticated tax planning don't even know that asset swaps and all these other things exist. But if you know it and you understand the tax code, a couple of you will be able to go today and figure it out, implement it in software, and then make it available to everybody else. What you're going to see now is the mechanism to be able to transact effortlessly and efficiently. And the great thing is these two specific areas of Bitcoin the protocol, which in my opinion are the two most interesting areas, smart contracts and triple entry accounting, will now get the level of investment that it probably deserves so that you start to see some really interesting businesses. Okay, but I want to go back to the first question. So you're primarily uh, seeing the investment opportunity as directly buying Bitcoins. Are you doing any investing in, in startups? Have, have you invested in any ASIC startups like uh, you know, Cointera? Um, you know, I had uh, an opportunity to invest in a couple well-known ASIC companies, and my background is in EE, and, you know, when you sit there and listen to these pitches, the thing that was, like, confusing to me is people didn't even know what the word tape out meant. And so they were trying to tell me that they were going to build a chip that did something, and I said, well, what's going to cost you to get the tape out on, like, you know, call it 20-something nanometer? And they didn't know. And, you know, I didn't want to spend 20 to $40 million to tape out a chip that could theoretically be obsolete by the time they actually got it out of a fab. And so, you know, all the way along, I've been very specific that I think Bitcoin as a store of value just has immense more ability to appreciate than any company necessarily. That doesn't mean that investing in a company is specifically bad. It just means that when, if given the choice, and frankly, because of the way our funds are structured and, you know, I have that flexibility, I chose to just invest in the Bitcoin. But I think if you had more traditional constraints and you were a more traditionally defined fund, um, it makes a lot of sense to invest in these companies because they will generate lots of value. They just may not generate as much value as the underlying currency itself, but that's okay. Well, I want to I go, 
uh, jump off from that contrast with folks like you know, Mark Andreessen and Chris Dixon and Andreessen and Horowitz, who are very upfront about their investment in companies, and 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 not so much, or or um, you know, they don't talk about their own holdings, or or they say that they haven't really made the investment that you've made. Do you think they're underplaying that, or do you think um, you know they're, they're sort of less optimistic as big, big, in Bitcoin the asset? No, no, no. I mean, I, I I actually believe them, and I think they they're doing a great job, and the fact that they're going to invest, I think Mark said hundreds of millions more, $250 million more or something. That's awesome. Look, the reality is social capital is not a venture fund. It is a vehicle. And it's a platform that we created to affect change. And it's an assembly of individuals, largely, and our capital, with me being the largest. And so we have a certain degree of flexibility in a way of viewing the world that doesn't necessarily have to map to a traditionally defined way of using capital. We don't raise from pension funds. We don't raise from university endowments. We don't raise. So how does owning Bitcoin affect change? I think it's progressing a, fin a set of financial changes that fundamentally empower a distributed class and disadvantages entrenched interests. And from that perspective, I think we should absolutely want that type of thing to win. And so when, when I specifically buy Bitcoin, what I'm thinking to myself is I'm using my own personal capital to hopefully prop up and support the emergence of something that would rip apart the existing financial system. And if it does, God bless it. And what will happen, and what will happen is individuals who are on the right side of history, on the right side of justice, will benefit. Individuals will be able to get access to capital easier. Individuals will be able to transact cheaper. Individuals will not get cheated. Simple example, you know, you talk about, for example, like remittances being a big business. For those of us who are not white and not born here, who send money back to a third world country, you will know that there, will, there are thugs that stand outside these money depots and will basically charge you like a cover charge to get into the bloody place to get your cash. And so when I send $100 back to Sri Lanka, you know, my uncle or my cousin may only get $70 because he has to give five or 10 just to get through the front door. That, that's bullshit, right? So like there's all of these things that are just so good and will change constructively if we have a fundamentally distributed secure currency. And it starts with property and property plus smart contracts and triple entry accounting equal a currency. So we should stop getting caught up in all the semantics and celebrate the fact that the US government now acknowledges what it is that you all care about. Hugely important. So yesterday, you believe, was a pivotal, pivotal day. But it feels like a lot needs to happen to facilitate this revolution. I mean, my mom is, is not, not buying, never, never mind my mom, I'm not buying Bitcoin. Because fundamentally, I don't want to, I don't, I, I, I actually don't believe I can hold on to it securely or am technologically savvy enough to, to protect the investment. So what needs to happen? How much innovation needs to occur to get to a what you're talking about? Um, and I think there are a lot of really good people here that are doing that. Zappo is doing that. Barry Silbert's doing that. Coinbase is doing that. Uh, Circle is doing that. There's all these great people, really smart technologists, who are going to go and solve those problems and make it accessible to a lot of people. And I think that's amazing. You know, I want to ask you about uh, Barry Silbert and Second Market. This may be a naive question, but the way I understood what they were doing is sort of acting as an investment bank and allowing uh, you know, people to buy and store Bitcoin with this new Second Market entity and then charging a commission. And it was all, you know, collecting a fee. And it was always my understanding that Bitcoin was supposed to, you know, we were going to erase the fee. So what, how, how are they able uh, to collect that? Uh, with the new no, so Bitcoin. let me explain. So, I mean, and also, full disclosure, I'm on the board of uh, Second Market. Um, Which is why I'm asking you the question. So what Barry created was the equivalent of an ETF. And the reason why an ETF is important is if you look at what ETFs did in the traditional stock market, it unlocked access to equity to a broad class of retail investor. So 20 or 30 years ago, one would buy individual stocks. It was not a thing that millions and millions of people engaged in until the creation of an ETF. Because what you were able to do was create a basket that tracked for example, in the case of the S&P, the S&P 500. And so you could buy one thing with one ticker symbol that you could check, that you could put into your IRA, that you could put into your 401k, and all of a sudden it would just move. And it abstracted out a lot of complexity. Similarly, in order for the 
understanding and then the ownership of Bitcoin to reach mass market adoption. We are going to need things like that that abstract complexity. I agree with you. Who the hell is going to go beyond us zealots, go to an online wallet, buy some stuff in an online exchange, transfer it to a wallet, put some in cold storage, keep some in a hot wallet, do this, do that, do the other thing? It's ridiculous. It's unusable by people who don't care. And things, when things scale, they need to be used by people who don't care, not just by people who give a shit, okay? So for all of us, we need to basically get to a place, and things like Barry's ETF do that, where by the end of this year, it's going to be exchange traded. Your parents now, or your mom, when she reads about Bitcoin and says, Brad, what should I do about this Bitcoin thing? You can say, well, you know what? Why don't you take a few thousand dollars and buy this ETF? You can use E-Trade. You can buy it whenever you want. You can sell it whenever you want. And all Barry does is charge a fee on the way in and on the way out, which is not dissimilar to how every other mutual fund or ETF works. But theoretically, should we no longer one day need an ETF when, when, when you know, the Bitcoin ecosystem uh, abstracts the complexity by itself? No, you'll always have it. So for example, like, I mean, US dollars, you can go to the bank today, but why do money market funds exist? Again, they exist because it's a pooled vehicle that creates a leveraged buying power and it creates uh, coherency in a market, right? And it allows multiple participants who have completely different needs to be able to transact in the same marketplace efficiently. So you may be buying it to buy, you know, you may need Bitcoin to buy bread, but the German government may be using it to be hedging euros. We shouldn't care. The point is we need all these mechanisms in place, and one of the things it will be what he's created. Um, Mark Andreessen spoke here yesterday, and um, he had a great quote. He was addressing Warren Buffett's uh, criticism of Bitcoin as a mirage, and he said something like, uh, well, my handwriting isn't, uh, isn't clear enough to make out what exactly he said. You guys probably know, but it was something akin to comparing him to other old white men who don't understand new technology. I wonder what you thought of, of Warren's statement, and, and, and you know, frankly, like, can you do any better than Mark on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think he's the best. You know, old white men are the best, right? <laughs> we got Buffett on one side, we got Perkins on the other. They're both kind of good at something, but they're both kind of crazy at other You're things. Like, yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, like, I think he's probably generally true. Uh, look, the reality is... You think Warren is generally right? No, I think, no. I think Mark's right. Like, okay, Mark. But, but as, a, as a general statement, mm -hmm. like the, the general statement which is true is that we're, we all tend to be dismissive or negative of things we don't fundamentally understand. And I think it's reasonable for a guy who's made 50, 60 billion dollars by owning things like Coca-Cola and Gillette to not understand Bitcoin. And forget like the last 13 years of tech as well, which he's also completely ignored. But he's allowed to do that, you know? And he's very successful in his own right. Just like, I don't know why I would buy Coca-Cola or Gillette. It just makes no sense to me. Sure, but he- So I'm just as crazy as he is. <laughs> sure, but, but he, has a, he has a record of being a, a pretty savvy, uh, you know, ana analyzer of financial in instruments. I would give him a little more credit than that. No, 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 my point is, there, there are lots of ways to make money. And this is actually a really good point. So. Um, we have to be respectful of many ways of making money if making money is the goal. Um, I've said that, you know, for me, again, this platform I want to use as a way to drive change in areas that I think are fundamentally broken. And money is my tool for change. So money is a necessary evil. So when I think about doing things, I have to think about it from a broad investing mindset of, can I generate returns? Because if I do, I can take this money and do something really awesome with it. I can fund Alzheimer's research, I can do something over here in education, whatever. So, you know, as an example, like, he can go and he can basically own these great CPG names and other things and make money for his investors, that's great. But I think Mark Andreessen can go and invest in Oculus Rift and Box and make money, and so can I. And I think that's all fine. I want to, um, we're going to zigzag a little bit because there are so many topics I want to cover with Chamath. Uh, we, we were talking about ASIC companies. I wonder what you think of um, 2186 and uh, a company that reportedly uh, is manufacturing these rigs but keeping them, uh, you know, basically for the benefit of monetizing the, the you know, the, the, the result of its mining. Is it beneficial to the Bitcoin ecosystem? I mean, fundamentally, like, look, the reality is, like, we're going to have to figure out a way for all of these guys to ride a cost curve that basically tracks to Moore's law, if not faster. Here, and independent of 21E6, but every company, here's the rubric that they have to solve. You have to figure out how, as, you know, the cost and the complexity of mining coins becomes more and more expensive, 
And the costs of basically generating an equivalently useful ASIC become, you know, it's, those are relatively static and fixed. How those curves cross. Because if it takes you longer than you expect, what you're going to find is by the time you actually tape out a chip and you can actually manufacture it and you can actually put it in rigs and you can actually start mining, you may not be generating that much profit because there's been a ton of folks that have been already doing it and picking the low-hanging fruit in China and India and all these other places. So it's a, just a really complex economic equation, and I think that in, in a lot of cases, is it a good investment? I think from my perspective, it's not the best allocation of capital. Do you th it's 20, 2026 is very secretive, so of course I'm completely fascinated now, if by they, if they is it. Wor out, is it working? What are you hearing? I don't know. If they, like I said, if they figure out in, at the right nanometer scale how to basically do cost-effective tape-out and manufacturing of these things, it will work. Um, like I said, if push came to shove for me, if I had you know, an incremental $5 million, uh, I would actually just assume that the existing ecosystem will figure out increasingly efficient ways of mining, and I'll just go and buy more Bitcoin. OK, let's talk about the collapse of Mt. Gox, um, some other recent small exchanges, uh, the Chinese exchanges mentioned by Bobby Lee in the last panel. Um, Terrible for Bitcoin or good in that it's clearing it's out awesome. some of the old data? Yeah, we got to flush out all the like the has been, also rans. You know, there's like a bunch of amateur hour bullshit in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And the reality is those people are really important at the beginning and they're like the biggest retardants of progress. And so they just need to get flushed out of the system. But you can't dismiss the negativity that surrounds these high profile. Failures. I mean, it, it uh, creates, it's created downward pricing pressure. I'm not saying yeah. that. I'm saying it's good that they fail. I'm saying more of the first generation of these things need to fail. And the reason is because they will get replaced by a more systematic approach to problem solving, the right checks and balances, the right regulatory participation, and that's what we should all want. This thing, if it's going to work, has to be something that basically works as a replacement to an existing system, but not because we are, you know, all of a sudden in one end of the room basically saying, don't even come close to us. We're living in our own little Xanadu. That just doesn't work. It's immature. It's not going to happen that way. And then that's the, that's the first reason why regulators and governments will come to basically quash it. And so all of the folks that like want to have either a libertarian bent or like some other political agenda and strap it on top of Bitcoin, they're re it's really bad for us. And you need to replace that with people who have a technological motive and a financial motive. Because those are boundable and understandable by traditional frameworks. And by the time they figure out that, oh my god, it's going to take over, it'll be too late. But if we wrap it in all this veneer of like, you know, hyperbolic bullshit, then what will happen is it will get shut down quickly. And that's bad for all of us. So Mt. Gox feeling, really good. Really, really good. And then the fact that the price stabilized and frankly rallied a little bit, even more important. It's such a signal now that there are constructive market participants here. This is a market. Guys, we are in the beginning of a massive market and ecosystem. A real one, a big one, a legitimate one, a mature one. We should all want that. So you don't think uh, this endemic volatility that we've seen over the past few months is, is just Dude, a characteristic? Look of at the volatility of gold. And the people in the gold market are like a thousand times dumber than the people in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So, I haven't seen any uh, late night Bitcoin uh, advertisements yet, uh, as there are with gold. Maybe, maybe there, there, yeah, there'll yeah. probably be some cash for Bitcoin yeah. ads soon. That's another That's business, business somebody should start. What? So, what's scaring you as a Bitcoin investor? You know, what what is scaring you now in terms of you know potential outcomes over the next few years? Um, Regu regulation, um, you know, the libertarian, the, the politics that you were. Talking I, about. I really, I really do. I'm concerned that you know we we need to divorce ourselves from all the political rhetoric. Um, I don't think that this is meant to be you know, a mechanism to evade taxes, a mechanism to push back on government structure. I think it's a mechanism to change a fundamentally broken system. And technology at its best, that's what we do. Technologists at our best, that is how we think about problems. And so if we can just like drop the ego-driven part of like wanting to you know, thumb our nose at the establishment, then I think what we're left with is actually a Trojan horse that replaces the establishment. And that's good enough, guys. So let's play long ball here. Let's take our time. Let's not like go for the quick ego in. Let's just like methodically plot and build systematically good, useful stuff. And by the time it's over, this will be the financial infrastructure on top of which a large amount of the world's economy runs. And it will benefit so many individuals in really constructive, obvious ways. And we'll all feel good 
We will all have made a lot of money, but we will have also generated more impact doing this than probably most anything else that we could be doing. Are there, are there potential uh, actions by uh, our government here or other foreign governments that worry you? Um, <clears throat> to be honest with you, no. I mean, like, you know, like, when, 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 like, you know, Manchin wrote that idiotic kind of thing that was like, oh, it's used for drugs, blah, 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 and then some other congressman basically, global, you know, search and replace Bitcoin for U.S. dollars. I mean, it, it, the hypocrisy of what's happening, again, which is why we have to divorce ourselves from the political rhetoric, the hypocrisy of what's happening is, you know, you want, a, you want an instrument of terrorism and drug, drugs and crime? The U.S. dollar is it. It is canonical. Right? That is like the dirty thing that none of us want to talk about. And so that's why I think it's, it's, it's better that we just focus on the positive parts of what's possible, try to cordon off the bad edge cases to a small percentage of the use cases. And the great thing about having the blockchain is we, you know, if we get to a place where we can associate that with names and identities, which I think eventually will happen because there will be a white space of a Bitcoin ecosystem where we'll all be very comfortable using our real name and identity, um, it'll be really good. And let's face it, like if you get to that place, that's way better than what's happening with the US dollar. I mean, we know this today. The CIA drops bushelfuls of money in front of the feet of Afghan warlords. What do you think they're doing with it? Buying bread and fucking cheese? That's not what they're doing. They're harvesting heroin and killing people. That's happening today. So we just have to like, just realize long ball. We gotta play long ball. Okay. Now, a lot of people ask, when will a Walmart take Bitcoin? When will Amazon take Bitcoin? I'll tailor that for you and I'll ask, when will the Golden State Warriors, a basketball team where you have a partial ownership stake, when will a basketball team like the Warriors start accepting Bitcoin? I think probably like as soon as, um, we get a bunch of other, so just in the priority of the things that we're working on, we're working on a stadium. And you know we're about to plow three quarters of a billion dollars, hopefully, into the San Francisco economy. And so as soon as we figure that out, we'll talk to BitPay and, and incorporate the ability to buy you know, $50 tickets with Bitcoin. Um, but it's just, the, it's just the prioritization of stuff. But by the way, the other thing is, Eventually, these retailers will want to do it because, you know, I mean, the ability to eliminate credit card fees, what was Goldman's thing was $250 billion a year, and then the ability on the behalf of a consumer to prevent fraud, those are hugely positive aspects of adopting some kind of a virtual cryptocurrency. And so it'll tip. Um, uh, you know, like, I mean, and, and you know Bezos probably better than any of us in this room. This is a guy that's like, I mean, if you want to kind of like scorch the earth and like, you know, basically like take every single ounce of profit and like, you know, pass it back to the consumers, oh, no this is the most obvious way to do it over and above, you know, vertically integrating and all the other things that he's already naturally doing. And yet they're not going to do anything that will confuse their customers. So they're going to have to wait until people are comfortable with it. Yeah, but now I think when you have, like I said, with IRS guidance, someone is going to develop a very clever product that basically allows you to use Bitcoin effectively like a currency with all of the mechanisms that allow it then to be accounted for properly like a, like a property, um, but is fundamentally then fungible like a currency. And I think that's quite straightforward now. Okay, a couple more questions. Are you optimistic at all about the alternatives to the alternative currency like Ripple, uh, you know, Dogecoin, all the other? No. I mean, that's like kind of like saying like, hey, uh, you've had a taste of the internet, now uh, I'd like you to go back to these AOL chat rooms. And it's just like, no. It's like, who cares? Let's focus our energy on the thing that's going to work. There's a, is there a network effect at work? That I mean, I just, I just think cool. it's arbitrage. I, th I honestly think fundamentally that's just like, people are arbitraging a trend. I think it's fine. If some people can speculate and make some money on it, whatever. Um, but the overwhelming majority of capital and our money and our time and our intellectual horsepower should be allocated to Bitcoin and the things around Bitcoin because I think it, ha it has the chance. And, you know, it's kind of like when Facebook was winning, it's not like, you know, we didn't spend our time figuring out, like, oh, you know, why are people using, I don't know, MySpace anymore? It's like, who cares? Are there growth patterns that you saw at Facebook that are being replicated here with Bitcoin? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, uh, one of the projects that I worked on very early on was our platform. And, you know, we had a way of like looking at our platform API usage to kind of think about what was happening in the ecosystem as a corollary to what would happen with user growth. And um, uh, we've done applied and, you know, we've, we've been doing a bunch of that same analysis here. And we see a lot of very similar patterns. 
And I think that's really constructive. So um, you know, when you look at sort of just like like you know Bitcoin um, and sort of like its distributed use, it's really impressive the amount of people that are now um, using it and uh, using it like meaning like 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 developers writing to it and using. And I think that's just a really big deal. You worked with Mark Zuckerberg for many years. You're still friendly with him. What does he think of Bitcoin? I think he thinks it's cool. I don't think they're going to do anything in the near term. I'm speculating. Um, but here's a great thing that would be awesome, is if Facebook figured out how to either partner or launch a secure wallet, and then how to basically apply their identity on top of it to create a white space within the blockchain so that transactions buying between people who are willing to be named has some mechanism to basically like have an easier way of doing things uh, acknowledged by governments and tax authorities, et cetera. That would be a game changer for Bitcoin overnight. I assume you've conveyed that to your former colleagues? I think it's a really good idea. <laughs> um, does it matter who Satoshi Nakamoto is? Well, we know who it isn't now. We know it's that poor, That, that like, list is getting longer. I mean, who cares? Yeah. I mean, hopefully, you know, the only reason to care is because that person or group of people at some point should really be celebrated. Well, look, everybody cares. Everybody cares. Th these stories are popular and debated care. for a reason. I don't care. I mean, look, we're, we're all going to mythologize this thing now to kingdom come. It's almost better that this person or group of people never, never, ne are never uh, uncovered. Um, because then, like, then it's really all of ours. And that's even more important. You know? And I think that's fine. Like, does anybody know who created OSPF? Okay, one guy. You're the asshole in the room. Great. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, but the point is, like, you know, nobody cares yet. It's the underpinning of the internet, and we all love it, and we all live with it. It's great. So I think if this is, ends up being one of those things, then great. Um, he, should, he or they should only come out to the extent that they want to get recognized. And, and I think and, then we should throw a don't. ticker tape parade in New York City for these people. Is he, is, is he or they, are they even identifiable if they don't want to be? Probably not. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you've had people that, that have been trying, and then you've had people who just looked in a phone book. And neither can get to the right answer. So, <laughs> um, you, you, You're an accomplished poker player. By the way, yeah. by the way, I mean, Newsweek, like, what, a, what, is that Clown Town over there? Like, what are they well, doing? It's they a, just it's, do a little Google search and, like, a, write an article? Like, yeah. did they use a bot to generate that article? I actually, that is shoddy journalism. I actually spent many years at Newsweek, but the institution that is now called Newsweek is, is, is not the same one. But she did a lot of legwork, but it was a very interesting case. What legwork? She flew to Orange County. No, there was a she lot. She flew to Orange County, of, found some random it, person named Satoshi. Nakamoto and took it was, a picture? It appears to be a very interesting case of, of By kind the of way, confirming, he had bedhead, so you knew he didn't even know that picture yeah. was about to be taken. Yeah. Right? So it's like he she just showed the, up, click, gotta go. <laughs> he, wasn't the, he wasn't the most credible of candidates, uh, so I'll give you that. Um, you're, a, you're an accomplished poker player. Are any of the same neurons firing as you do your work in Bitcoin? Um, well, I mean, you know, I'll tell you like the, the, the things that. Uh, well, no. I was going to give you a clever answer. No. I mean, I, I just think this is a, honestly, it's, it's probably the single biggest high beta investment opportunity of our lifetime. I just don't know how else to say it. Simply put, that's what it is. Um, that's why, honestly, I, I, would, I, I really think that it should be owned by as many people as possible because I think if you know, we look back in 30 years and these things are at a million a coin, I, I think it would be better that many people have shared in that appreciation instead of a few. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm such a, I'm evangelical about it, because I, I think it's, you can own one, you can own five, you can own a few Satoshi. Just, I think everyone should just have a little taste of it. And that's why, whether you go to Coinbase and open a wallet and do it there, or you, know, you use Barry's new exchange, or you buy into his ETF, I just think, the more doors into the same house, the better. We should all participate in this upside. Because I think it's going to happen. And what shouldn't happen is a few should not control all the coins. OK, um, I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, just tell us, what, tell me what your future plans are here with your, your personal holdings. Um, you know, where, to, to, you know, how much do you want to own? And, and then do you think of, if, if the right company comes along, could you make an investment? We've, we've started incubating a triple entry accounting product. Um, 
we have an investment, large investment in second market. They're going to, you know, part of their business is going to now focus on a Bitcoin exchange. I really want to find something in smart contracts. Um, so it's not that we've not done any investing in companies. It's just that we've been slower. We've been just much more aggressive in buying the underlying property slash currency. Um, with respect to our future plans there, yes, I would like to buy more. And, um, you know, as we get more liquidity as, you know, like, I mean, we had a lot of confidence last year because we had, you know, we got, we, were, we got really lucky. Market was ripping, you know. I mean, you know, we, I think we did like 43% in the public book. And so we just, we were generating a ton of profit. And so we were just like, what are we going to do with this? We're like, ah, buy more Bitcoin. So we're just like drunken sailors just buying Bitcoin. Ah. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to continue to buy some. Um, were you hurt by the decrease in price over the last few months? Oh yeah, but I mean, I mean, our cost basis, we were fortunate. Um, but our cost basis is like in the, you know, sub 100. So it's good. We're in a good spot. Well, great. Um, I think uh, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, Chamath.